Welcome to the Women's Heart Health Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Menelicino, Medical Director of the Mental Clinic in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. This is your chance to hear from international experts about how to achieve optimal vitality, optimal heart health, and prevent heart disease. We're fortunate to be joined today by Dr. David Perlmutter. Thank you, David. I am delighted to be here. Let me tell our viewers a little bit about you. I've known you for a decade, one of my favorite speakers to listen to at all the conferences you go to. And I remember one time you made a point about brain and inflammation and thunder went off rolling in the conference arena. And so uh, you're connected in a higher level too. Oh, I, I don't remember that, but that sounds great. <laughs> Dr. David Perlmutter is a board-certified neurologist and four-time New York Times best-selling author. He serves on the board of directors and is a fellow of the American College of Nutrition. Dr. Perlmutter re received his medical degree from the University of Miami School of Medicine, where he was awarded the Leonard G. Roundtree Research Award. He serves as a member of the editorial board for the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and has published extensively in peer-reviewed scientific journals, including Archives of Neurology, Neurosurgery and the Journal of Applied Nutrition. In addition, he's a frequent lecturer at symposia sponsored by institutions such as the World Bank, the IMF, Columbia University, Scripps University, New York, Inst New York University, Harvard University, and serves as an associate professor at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. His books have been published in 34 languages and include the number one New York Times bestseller, Grain Brain, also, The Surprising Truth About Wheat, Carbs, and Sugar, with over one million copies in print. He's the editor of the upcoming collection, The Microbiome in the Brain, that will be authored by top experts in the field and published in 2019 by CRC Press. So again, David, I am super appreciative of you joining us today. And uh, the work that you're doing, the message that you're spreading, it's really taking a lot of people by surprise, but the more they look into it, the more they know that you're, that you're right. Well, uh, first again, <clears throat> thank you for having me. And, you know, while the uh, intro, I think, would depict me as being uh, really focused on the brain and focused on neurology, uh, which is certainly uh, what I've done all these years, I think it's really important for your viewers to understand that these processes that affect the brain are the exact same pathways and processes and mechanisms that damage the heart. So, you know, I don't know if a thunderclap is going to go off now when I mention inflammation, but uh, as I mention it in reference to the brain being that fundamental mechanism that underlies things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, let's be clear that this process of inflammation is front and center as it relates to what damages the arteries, the blood supply to the heart, and, uh, you know, really uh, what is the primary cause of cardiovascular disease uh, in men and women. And, you know, I think the, uh, the purpose of this summit is really very, very important because <clears throat> I think the, uh, you know, the notion that cardiovascular disease is a male uh, related thing is sort of a carryover from uh, the 60s and 70s yes. when, you know, men would be working hard and have a heart attack and no one knew why. And, you know, the, the truth of the matter is here in America, this is the cause of, uh, the, of death in one third of uh, you know, the third leading cause of death in women is that they die of cardiovascular disease. And, you know, a, a lot of it, as much as 80% of that cardiovascular disease is actually preventable. And uniquely, uh, yes. and interestingly, uh, those ideas that relate to prevention of cardiovascular disease in women are the same ideas that we talk about that relate to other inflammatory issues like Alzheimer's, obviously a brain uh, issue. So, it's not as if a lifestyle pursuit might be good for one part of the body, but bad for the other part. It's really, as we move forward in time, uh, interesting to watch how there's such convergence yes. uh, in the recommendations for the brain, for the heart, for the immune system, uh, for controlling blood sugar, et cetera. Well, you've, you've really hit on such a good point. And I, I know we see this with our clients that a lot of women particularly come in they're not really concerned about their heart health, but they're concerned about their cognitive or brain health. They, they're not really worried about whether they're going to have a heart attack or not, but they're deathly afraid of whether they're going to have cognitive impairment or dementia or Alzheimer's because it's, it's all around us. And that sometimes is a, a way to start the discussion of the heart or the gut or of hormones to really have a, 
an opening dialogue of how to talk about the rest of the body. Well, again, um, <clears throat> you know, the fundamental uh, mechanism is inflammation. And this is what underlies chronic degenerative diseases, whether they be involved in the heart, the brain, the immune system, uh, related to cancer, diabetes, you name it. And the World Health Organization now characterizes chronic degenerative conditions, uh, which are, uh, they didn't say inflammation related, but I'm saying it now, as the number one cause of death on planet Earth, not uh, infectious plagues and yes. war, et cetera. It's that we're just falling apart with a reference to heart disease and brain disease, uh, cancer, diabetes, uh, in relationship to the uh, lifestyle changes that are so prevalent globally now, uh, which uh, used to be looked upon favorably called westernization, but now we understand that as uh, third world countries adopt the Western world's diets, then their rates of cardiovascular disease and uh, stroke uh, and Alzheimer's, et cetera, are in lockstep with those uh, seemingly salubrious changes, which we now recognize are anything but. So uh, there's not been a sudden genetic shift globally that explains this incredible increase in these conditions. It is environmental, meaning foods that we eat, uh, levels of physical activity, uh, other issues in the environment that are by and large uh, controllable and modifiable and you know that is, I think, uh, front and center in terms of what you're trying to accomplish with this summit. That is uh, to tell uh, people that it doesn't have to be this way. I mentioned earlier that as much as 80% of cardiovascular disease in women is preventable. Yes. And you know to, to recognize that as many as 90% of women uh, here in America may have a, a risk factor, an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. My goodness, we have to uh, really get this message out. That's the mission here. Well, you mentioned genetics, and I think that's something that a lot of our clients don't really understand the impact of it. And when I trained in Phoenix, I met some Native Americans, the Pima Indians, whose several generations ago were warrior genes that were lean and lived in one of the most inhospitable environments on the planet and survived. Now with the lifestyle changes of white flour, white sugar, they have the highest rates of obesity and diabetes that we've ever seen. So how the genes not changed, but the ecosystem around did. That's right. And I was actually there the day before yesterday, oddly enough. Hmm. And uh, what you're saying is, it's not just true about the Pima, but, but many indigenous uh, cultures around the globe. I mean, uh, certainly if you visit northern New Zealand, uh, you, you know, you're able to experience that as well. And I think what we're talking about is that you know, these individuals carry what we call the thrifty gene, yes. which is a, a gene, uh, it isn't a gene, it's a genetic uh, array that allows them to be uh, able to survive in conditions of caloric scarcity, i.e. when there's not adequate amounts of food available for these individuals, uh, their bodies are able to extract calories from the minimal amounts of foods that they have, and preserve uh, their bodies by virtue of making fat under adverse conditions, which allows them to survive. Well, you turn the tables on that gene today when uh, calories are overabundant, but yet the gene switch is still on, and so they make fat, and they hold on to fat. They can't break it down and use it as a fuel uh, source, and uh, you're right. Uh, I was involved in uh, a, a the production of a movie called The Magic Pill that mm -hmm. is now uh, on YouTube. And uh, in that movie, we discuss the uh, indigenous uh, individuals living in uh, Australia and how uh, they have been so incredibly affected, as you say, by obesity and diabetes, by suddenly being exposed to a westernized diet uh, and how that has negatively affected them. So you know, again, I really want your viewers to take home the notion that um, you know, this profound epidemic of cardiovascular disease in women, and particularly, uh, you know, understanding that in African American women, it is the number one cause of death in yes. America. And by and large, it is uh, preventable. Right. Uh, you know, we've got to understand that uh, we are creating a generation of diabetics, basically that the dietary shift that has happened over the past 30 years here in America by making us fat phobic has caused us to shift our diets in favor of carbohydrates 
and that is clearly responsible for this absolute epidemic of diabetes that we are seeing. So we've got to relate becoming diabetic with profound risk for cardiovascular disease. The risk is increased three to four fold in women, risk of cardiovascular disease, if a woman becomes a diabetic, and only two to three fold in men only. I mean, that's huge, but it's more so in women. So you don't want to become diabetic. And there are a couple of things that need to be looked at that are involved in risk Please. increase for women to become diabetic. Again, women should do everything they can not to become diabetic. That means a diet that has more fat and less carbohydrates. But here's another very important point that women need to recognize. That taking a statin drug, according to the uh, Women's Health Initiative study that was published in 2017, women taking a statin medication, which presumably is good for their heart, have a 71% increased risk for becoming diabetic which is associated with a three to four fold increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Somebody's got to yell that out from, from the highest mountain. I mean, it's, uh, it's very sad that women now, you know, roll into their doctor's office and have high cholesterol. And the doctor says, you know, that's a risk factor for heart disease. We need to put you on a statin drug yeah. because we need to intervene to control one blood marker whereby we are going to increase by 71% your risk for diabetes associated with a three to four fold increased risk for the very disease that they're trying to prevent. That's so, one of the biggest paradoxes in medicine right now, isn't it? Oh my gosh. It's an extremely myopic uh, approach uh, that is really beyond myopic. It's paradoxical. Well, David, you, you've, you've really taught me to fall in love with my mitochondria. You were one of the first people that really opened my eyes to how important the mitochondria are and how susceptible they are to toxicity by drugs like the statin drugs or by our environmental toxins and how they can lead to these neurologic illnesses, blood sugar dysregulation, heart issues, Alzheimer's issues. The, you, you talked about how when we were in the caveman, cavewoman days, the inflammation helped us to protect us against bugs, but that inflammatory response is now hindering us when we bathe it with all of the processed foods and lack of activity and all of the other things. How do you tie that together for people in a way they can understand? Do you, do you have a, a good way to tie the genes? To the uh, you'll, you'll have to determine whether it's good or bad, but I will say <laughs> that, um, you know, let's take a step back. As we talk about Please. inflammation and as we are being uh, very derogatory about it, understand it's a very important process in the body that helps us deal with invading organisms, with trauma, et cetera. We wanna wall off areas and we wanna recruit uh, blood supply and white blood cells to areas of damage or infection, that's for sure. Uh, that's the upside of inflammation. But the downside is that this chronic exposure to these inflammatory chemicals damages uh, the body in many significant ways. You mentioned mitochondria. We know that uh, these chemicals of inflammation that we call uh, cytokines, or now more appropriately adipokines, as they are fat-derived, are directly toxic to mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And also very important vis-a-vis -vis our earlier conversation, that inflammation uh, tends to target what's called the insulin receptor, making it less functional, and as such, tends to drive up blood sugar, which does what? Makes more inflammation. So it becomes what we call a feed-forward cycle. Mm -hmm. Becoming diabetic increases inflammation, inflammation makes you more diabetic, raises your blood sugar. So that is a, uh, a carousel that you don't want to get on. And if you do get on, there's a way off. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But you bring up an interesting point about the mitochondria. And, you know, we learned years ago, and you know, certainly being taught in high school biology, that these mitochondria are the power plants of our cells. Mm -hmm. And they are but they're far more uh, than that. They are actually involved in keeping a cell alive, regulating the mechanisms in a cell that determines whether it will live or die. Uh, we call that the apoptosis uh, mm -hmm. gen genetic pathway, which will cause a cell to die. We also know that uh, mitochondria are directly involved in regulating uh, inflammation. Uh, mitochondria control what has been now called the inflammasome, which is 
kind of the gatekeeper for the inflammatory cascades that occur in our bodies. Defects in how our energy plants, the mitochondria, work are sensed by this um, inflammasome. If any of you techies are listening, it's, it's through what's called mTOR, uh, the uh, mitochondrial target of rapamycin, if you want to look that one up, mTOR. But that's, well, that's, that's, signal, that's where the gate is. But how intriguing it is that our energy producing organelles that live in the cell, and each cell may have as many as a thousand mitochondria, do far more than make energy. They're regulating inflammation in the body. And once again, we have a dangerous, what we call feet forward cascade. It's that if the mitochondria are dysfunctional, they'll create increased free radicals, reactive oxygen species that stimulate the inflammasome to make higher levels of cytokines, the inflammatory chemicals, which do two things. They feed back and damage the mitochondria, setting into motion this feed forward cascade. And as mentioned, they uh, irritate the insulin receptor. Now the insulin receptor then can't do its job to help lower our blood sugar. But well beyond that, we know that damaging the insulin receptor, uh, in, in other words, the receptor that mediates how insulin works in our body, has very profound uh, brain implications as well, certainly an area of interest for me. But beyond that, when the insulin receptor is uh, compromised, insulin doesn't work as well. When insulin doesn't work as well, uh, our blood sugar goes up, and elevated blood sugar then ultimately becomes a diagnosed issue called type 2 diabetes. And as mentioned earlier, type 2 diabetes increases a woman's risk for cardiovascular disease by three to four fold. Right. So this is a powerful relationship then between uh, problems with how our energy producing issues, the mitochondria work, and ultimately developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So we've got to take good care of our mitochondria. And that is we've got to adopt a diet that's lower in carbs, lower in sugar, and has higher levels of, dare I say, the dreaded fat. That is the diet humans have been on for a couple million years. And that is the diet, contrary to what we've been told for the past three or four decades, that is the diet that's good for the heart. So David, what are the good fats and bad fats that you tell people that they should avoid or that they should incorporate? Because there seems to be a lot of um, different advice about what fats should be. It was low fat, then it was keto. Now, where do you, do you how do you individualize that for, for your clients? Uh, first of all, you know, globally, I think we should recognize that fat is our friend and has really been our friend uh, for as long as we've walked this planet. Most of our calories in our history have come from fat. And suddenly, in a millisecond ago, uh, we were told fat is terrible. We shouldn't uh, eat fat, we should eat more carbs. That was the message that was delivered to us uh, through our peer-reviewed medical journals, now learning that those studies were underwritten by industry, the sugar industry, which wanted us to eat more sugar and eat less fat. Um, and I believe that is responsible for more death on this planet than both world wars combined. Well, that's an interesting thing. Sudden shift away from fat and into carbohydrates uh, has paved the way for this uh, beyond epidemic proportion of these chronic degenerative conditions, as I discussed earlier. So uh, you bring up a very good uh, point, Mark, and that is that you know there are fats that are healthful for us and some which are dangerous. Uh, by and large, the vegetable oils that you might see on your grocery store shelf, uh, the safflower oil, canola oil, um, uh, sunflower oil, et cetera, corn oil especially, should be dr uh, avoided like the plague mm -hmm. uh, uh, for a number of reasons. Most of these um, <clears throat> are sourced from genetically modified uh, plants. That is an issue because uh, those plants have been sprayed with a significant toxin called the glyphosate or its uh, uh, analogs to uh, kill weeds, and that is residual in these and other plants that are genetically modified. That will get back to the gut, and we'll talk about that perhaps a little bit later and increase inflammation. 
Uh, beyond that, though, the, these fats that are modified to have their shelf life forever in the grocery store mm -hmm. create, <clears throat> are used by the body, if that's what you're consuming, and create cell membranes that are not as functional as they could be. So we should be favoring good sources of unprocessed, for example, monounsaturated fats like you might find uh, in avocado oil or by eating avocados and uh, certainly olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, is about the healthiest type of fat you can imagine. Um, do not fear saturated fat. In a uh, recent study that looked at uh, the dietary habits across five continents, it was shown that higher levels of saturated fat were associated with a 20% reduction in risk for death. You remember when we were told <laughs> saturated fat was terrible and uh, and here we are now recommending things like uh, eggs and coconut oil and MCT oil that have saturated fat in them. You know, 50% uh, of the fat in human breast milk is saturated fat. So if you are castigating saturated fat, then you're saying that God or nature, however you want to uh, phrase it, got it wrong in terms of designing a human breast milk. It's good for the body. It's critically important for the brain. Why saturated fat is uh, such a plus is because by virtue, by definition, being saturated, it is resistant to being oxidized. Right. And beyond that, we know that a diet that is higher in fat, especially when the sugar and carbohydrates are restricted, does tend to create what you had mentioned earlier, and that is these ketone bodies, uh, allowing people to get into a state of ketosis, meaning that their bodies now are... Uh, moving away from burning glucose or sugar as a fuel source in favor of burning a special type of fat that we call ketones, which turns out to be, uh, for humans, an absolute super fuel. And the whole ketogenic movement, is, it's a, interesting how one idea gets so much steam. You're talking about the saturated fat in breast milk, and there's some studies showing how the toxicity of the mother gets transferred to the child through the breast milk and through the carry by the saturated fat. You mentioned the glyphosate and whether it's an organic GMO raised food versus non-organic non-GMO. Well, where, where do you see that as being where you can hedge your bets? Can we have none of it with this stuff with the glyphosate? Where, where do you make that line? Now, ideally, everyone would like to be all organic, all pure, and never do it. But where can you kind it's of hit your bets with the difference? That's a great that's question. I mean, I think what I'm you're asking sure. in 2019, how do you live your life? Uh, I think you do the best you can mm -hmm. in all of your lifestyle choices, whether it's exercise, sleep, uh, diet, uh, your relationships. These are all choices that you make, and you got to do the best you can. The deck is clearly stacked against us in terms of having uh, availability uh, to, to do 100%. And maybe um, more so for women because of the hormonal sensitivities, the epidemic of thyroid disease, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis. I think it's that's harder, right. I think, for and, um, you know, I, I think uh, as you have uh, and as we have today called attention to the fact that, you know, this is uh, cardiovascular disease is such a huge issue under recognized in women. Hey, guess what? Uh, Alzheimer's is two to one a woman's disease. Yeah. So uh, there are a lot of factors that are involved in that. And let me walk that, uh, to take that to a place of uh, explanation beyond uh, the simple idea that women stop uh, menstruating and their hormone levels uh, change. But let's take it to an earlier situation earlier in life. And that is to understand that PCOS a polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, is now affecting up to 20% of women in Western cultures. What does it mean? It means that they develop insulin resistance, uh, but importantly in my field, uh, that PCOS uh, is associated in women with a 9 to 14% reduction in brain metabolism of sugar, which is comparable to what we might see on a brain scan that measures this of a 70 year old. And these are women in their twenties and thirties and it's epidemic. So 
I think that diet is key here. I think we have to, again, focus on the notion of powering the brain with fat, powering the heart with fat, and beyond that, understand that when women are in a state of ketosis and creating good ketone chemicals like one called beta-hydroxybutyrate, that beyond just serving as a fuel, getting back to our discussion of the mitochondria, this is a powerfully anti-inflammatory approach. And beyond that, reestablishes this forgotten sensitivity of the insulin receptor. So it sounded bad before. You had your, uh, you had your inflammation, your problems with the insulin receptor, damaging the mitochondria, which led to more inflammation. You're thinking, gee, we're in deep trouble, and you are. But you can jump off the carousel, and you can jump off that carousel by targeting your mitochondria, by targeting your insulin receptor, and by targeting inflammation. And you do that by getting on a diet that will create these chemicals in your body called ketones which really emulates the type of metabolism that humans have had yes. for a couple of million years and that we've suddenly come away from just in the past couple of centuries. And David, do you see some of your clients uh, that go to the ketone, the, uh, do, the ke do the ketosis and do the ketogenic diet and actually don't do well? And what's unique about those people or their metabolism or their genetics the way they just don't process it because some people do really good for a while and then crash and they, they think they're doing everything right. And it actually kind of sabotages them. It's a great question, Mark. And uh, I get a question mark. I didn't realize it was, <laughs> it raises a question mark, doesn't it? Uh, and I think that um, there are very, very few number of uh, men and women who ultimately can't do great on a ketogenic diet. But do some people have problems? They do, but they're, they're, uh, they're work throughs. Uh, I would rank probably the, the, on top of the list of issues people get into going on a ketogenic diet, constipation. Mm -hmm. The reason that happens is very straightforward and, and so easy to, to work around. Uh, what happens is people think uh, that, oh, I'm going to go low carb and get on a ketogenic diet and I'm going to be great. And you have to understand what it means. Low carb doesn't mean getting rid of your fiber. Right. And that becomes a huge issue. So when you stop eating uh, complex carbohydrates in the form of fiber, you're going to have problems. You're going to have problems in terms of nutrition and also certainly physical problems by not having uh, adequate fiber in your gut. And perhaps most importantly, you're not going to nurture your gut bacteria, which are really going to be hugely helpful for you on a ketogenic diet. The other issue we see uh, is that you've got to pay attention uh, to adequate amounts of things like potassium, magnesium, uh, and sodium. Mm -hmm. uh, so in other words, minerals become really a key on a ketogenic diet. So you've got to be cognizant of that, you know, welcoming some salt back to the table. And understand that not everybody keto adapts or feels great on a ketogenic diet the next day. It may take a couple of weeks and you have to you know, understand that and be willing to uh, give, it a, give it a try. Uh, I would say that the number of people that I've encountered who have a genetic issue uh, that doesn't allow them to do well on a ketogenic diet is extremely, extremely small. So I think that uh, you need to work with a healthcare uh, provider. Uh, you need to read uh, various books that are out there. Uh, understand that fiber is critical. You can be on a ketogenic diet and be vegetarian. There's a wonderful book uh, called Ketotarian by Will Cole. Mm -hmm. that talks about that. I had the opportunity to interview him recently. Uh, so the idea of being on a ketogenic diet is not uh, incongruous with being uh, on a vegetarian diet. So, uh, so true. you know, people think that being on a ketogenic diet is Ad uh, Atkins diet redux. It is not. You're not sitting around eating pork uh, rinds all day and <laughs> hoping that you get into ketosis. It's a diet that you can do vegetarian. Well, you, um, you mentioned you mentioned a lot of these different foods, and we're lucky here in Jackson Hole, we have this vertical harvest where they took the side of a parking garage and turned it into a greenhouse. And it's all organic. It's one of the best veggies that comes out of, of our community. And those tomatoes taste different than even the organic tomatoes that I buy at our whole food store here. And the eggs that you can get, my neighbor raises eggs with omega-fed, hand-raised, and the yolks are this bright orange, 
Whereas when I went out for breakfast with some friends, they were pale yellow. So it's it, an egg is not an egg, a tomato is not a tomato, and, and grain is not meat. meat, and meat's not meat, and grain's not grain. Uh, can can we come back <laughs> to the grain for a minute? Because you're such the world's expert. How, how is it? There's so much confusion about. Is it GMO? Is it hybridized? What's so different about the amber waves of grain I ran through as a kid versus the shinhai wheat that I see growing in Idaho? Uh, what, what happened, David? What happened to um, I, I, it's, it's a lot uh, to answer here. I mean, I basically, what really happened was the predominance that grain and grain-based foods uh, have taken in terms of a calorie source in the human diet. That's, That's the true. big issue here. And that uh, now 40% uh, of the foods we consume are derived from wheat. And the biggest issue beyond wheat being sprayed with glyphosate and the gliadin issue, which I think is actually very important, the biggest issue by far and away is that when we have a grain-based diet, we have a carb-based diet and a story. So that's the huge issue that, you know, when agriculture was uh, developed 10 to 14,000 years ago, the date keeps getting pushed back, it really shifted for the first time uh, for humans, uh, the diet uh, away from uh, a diet that was one of basically what you could find or kill, i.e. protein, uh, some uh, plants, of course, fiber, fiber rich plants, lower in simple carbs, uh, and fat, as mentioned, fat being a really wonderful source of calories, to grains, which were uh, portable, uh, storable, uh, allowed us to move around, allowed us to harvest and then have a source of food, I'll put it in quotes, uh, over a period of time and extend our period of calorie availability. And that, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, you know, targeted our genome. Our genome is one uh, that... Uh, responds to these cues dramatically. And one of the important cues that our genome responds to uh, are cues that let us know what season of the year it is. By that, I mean that we now uh, understand that uh, the expression of our genome changes mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, according to environmental experiences. When we mimic uh, what our ancestors would experience in the fall, uh, our genome changes. In the fall, in the past, when we were in our hunter-gatherer days, sugar in the form of a ripened blueberry, for example, uh, would tell us that winter is coming. How so? It would change our microbiome, first of all, and uh, allow our blood sugars to increase. But also sugar is found in natural uh, foods like fruit, which tend to ripen in the late summer, early fall, meaning that here we are tied into the seasons of the year and we're suddenly getting sugar in the diet. It tells our bodies to uh, make insulin to deal with the sugar. And insulin is far more important than simply lowering your blood sugar. Insulin tells your body winter is coming, meaning make and store fat. And now we are targeting that genetic mechanism year round uh, and that began with the uh, adoption of a diet based upon agriculture, i.e. based upon grain, like we led into this conversation with. So what has changed then uh, since the advent of agriculture is this powerful signal that we're sending to our genome that winter is coming. That's great. Now we're telling our genome winter is coming 365 days a year as we bombard our DNA with this sugar signal uh, and therefore stimulate the genetic pathways to make inflammation, uh, stimulate insulin to, uh, to, to tell our bodies that we need to make and store fat. So that is you know, the cornerstone of why this adoption of a grain-based diet is really responsible, I think, globally for our declining health. Certainly spraying with glyphosate is a problem. Certainly gliadin and its effects on the health and integrity of the gut lining is an issue. But the overriding issue here with respect to grain entering the human diet is the carbohydrate story. Now, does it mean that you can't eat grains? By all means, it does not mean that. Uh, can you have an, uh, a portion of an organic corn or rice? 
Absolutely. But to center the diet on bread and pastries and pasta and uh, other forms of grain-derived high-carbohydrate uh, foods is a huge mistake. You know, David, I, I grew up with irritable bowel syndrome, and it wasn't until I realized that it was really dairy and egg for me. But I've never tested positive on all the food sensitivity type tests to gluten. And I didn't realize it was a problem until I went to Europe and spent three weeks in Italy eating Italian bread. My stomach was flat. I felt great. My energy was good. My sleep was good. The first day back, I had a bagel and my stomach bloated. And I hear a lot of my clients say, the bread here is just different than what I eat when I go to Europe or I go to other countries. Is it truly that different? Uh, it is different to some degree. Um, I, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the main things that we see here and why, you know, various areas of Europe are, will not import American wheat uh, may well have to do with the fact that, by and large, wheat in America is sprayed with glyphosate and herbicide. Now, if you know anything about wheat in America, you might wonder why do we do that? Because the wheat here is not GMO. And generally we think of glyphosate in relation to GMO because the reason that seeds for corn and soy are, are modified is to make them glyphosate resistant. So the farmer can spray the crops with this herbicide and the actual crop doesn't die, but the weeds will. Well, the wheat used here in America is not uh, tr uh, GMO. It's not uh, um, a special right. type of seed to be resistant to glyphosate. So having said that, uh, in the wisdom of marketing, farmers were convinced that if they spray their crops with this poison, uh, that they will then be able to dry it out more quickly and bring it to market and therefore uh, attain a higher level of profitability. So that practice of spraying the food that you will eat here in America with poison has now become very, very widespread. The World Health Organization characterizes glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen, a cancer-causing agent being sprayed on the very food that we eat, being sprayed on the wheat that went into the bagel that you then ate and didn't feel well uh, thereafter. So uh, I would say that is certainly a huge difference uh, between eating a bagel here and a croissant in, uh, in France. <laughs> but I do want to make it clear that, you know, we tend to um, think that, well, you know, I didn't eat bread today. I had a bagel or I had a croissant or I had toast, call it what you will. Uh, but it's bread, you know, rose by any name, any other name uh, is still a powerful source of of and, carbs. Of, and of, isn't a serving of bread essentially a handful of sugar, the way your yeah, body processes? Um, you know, what that does to your glycemic uh, load is very high. The glycemic index of a whole grain bread is, is higher than a, a Snickers bar, for that matter. So I think that shocks a lot of people to hear. Yeah, and I, I think that, that uh, I would say at the end of the day, even at the beginning of the day, uh, that we really, uh, aside from our discussions about glyphosate and about uh, gluten and gliadin, et cetera, uh, I think the big issue here that needs to be confronted is what is bread doing to your blood sugar and therefore your insulin receptor, mm -hmm. and how is it paving the way for you to become uh, insulin resistant, which opens the door to diabetes, which increases a woman's risk for cardiovascular disease by three to fourfold, as we've talked about. That's the relationship that needs to be vetted uh, and uh, you know, really revealed uh, in terms of this huge epidemic of cardiovascular disease in women, uh, I believe relating to you know, not just women, but uh, all downstream consequences of becoming diabetic, which you know, uh, is a huge problem here in America. Uh, diabetes and prediabetes affects as many as 80 million uh, Americans. And what does that mean? It means that uh, we are paving the way for these individuals to have these uh, chronic degenerative conditions, and it's got to stop. And I've heard others talk about uh, dementia and Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. And so really, a, a lot of people come in to see me with a normal blood sugar on a fasting blood test, but when we check their insulin or challenge them with an insulin challenge, it spikes. And these tend to be people who might be skinny fat, that have no fat on the outside, but they're laying down that internal visceral fat. How do you explain that concept of type 3 diabetes? And do you feel like it's a valid 
concept and, and tying it to the brain and the heart? Well, I, I think it's, it, it's a bit of an unfortunate moniker <laughs> yeah. for diabetes. I mean, I mean, for Alzheimer's disease being type 3 diabetes because, uh, you know, type 1 and type 2 are characterized by elevated blood sugar. And Alzheimer's, uh, you can have Alzheimer's and have a, a so-called normal blood sugar. Though what we define as normal, I think, needs to be reevaluated. I'd rather know what's optimal in terms of blood sugar. Right. Uh, but that said, uh, I think we're now fully understanding that glucose utilization is a powerful harbinger for uh, Alzheimer's, that the brain's ability to use glucose as a, um, a fuel source uh, may be predictive of Alzheimer's 20 years in advance. Uh, that said, we, you know, the idea that when you do these brain scans that show glucose utilization in the brain being defective in people with pre-Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment, you know, you, you might think that, oh, these areas that we see on the brain scan that are demonstrating poor glucose utilization, these, the reason that's happening is because these brain cells, these neurons are dying, and therefore they're not using blood sugar. That is completely flawed. How do we know that? We know that because now, in addition to brain scans that show uh, glucose utilization, we have brain scans that show ketone utilization, that uh, image uh, what's called C11 uh, acetoacetate, or a ketone that's radioactive, uh, radio uh, labeled. So we are able to see um, brain metabolism when uh, ketones are administered to an individual, and the very areas uh, that were not functioning when glucose was the fuel source actually are functioning quite well, thank you very much, in these individuals once they are uh, delivered ketones. So what does it tell us? It tells us, and this is a very important message, it tells us that uh, this metabolic defect that so characterizes the early Alzheimer's brain is reversible. And uh, it, you know, does that mean that early Alzheimer's is reversible? Well, We've seen that now uh, in the work of Dr. Dale Bredesen, the reversal of Alzheimer's, a disease for which there is zero medical treatment available on the planet. There is no pharmaceutical treatment for Alzheimer's, and yet what Dr. Bredesen has done is not just resupply the brain with fuel, but improve a variety of parameters that relate to downfall or dysfunction of the brain uh, in the Alzheimer's patient, normalizing homocysteine, vitamin uh, D levels, looking at hormones, reducing toxins, improving uh, brain fuel availability, getting people to exercise to increase their production of a brain hormone that allows regrowth of brain cells. We call that BDNF. So you really so, do have to take a whole person approach. You bet. Uh, what I'm uh, hearing that is so. It is uh, you know the idea that we're going to prevent a woman's cardiovascular disease by giving you a, a statin drug. How uh, we talked about earlier. How narrow-minded is that? What we need to be talking about is fo uh, focusing on uh, reestablishing normal blood sugar and insulin sensitivity. For That's that individual. Right. How Why? do we do it for that individual? What yeah, your and that, you're exactly right. Uh, and I think that uh, opens the door to weight loss, yes. to reducing this uh, body fat that is pro-inflammatory, to reestablishing sensitivity of the insulin receptor, to reestablishing better blood lipids, uh, to lowering blood sugar, to uh, increasing the production of this chemical called beta hydroxybutyrate, a ketone. So that's the ticket. You that's know the what? power of lifestyle medicine. Uh, there's no magic pill for this. It's not a pill for the ill, no, like we were I mean, taught in medical to, school. You know, to this day, we, you know, people think, well, there's a pill for my heart, there's a pill for my yeah. brain, and pill for my diabetes, and what happens? They end up taking 11 or 12 different medications a day for blood pressure, diabetes, uh, high, blood, high lipids or cholesterol, uh, maybe something for weight loss, maybe something to keep their brain working. What a, a mess, because, uh, you know, above all, do no harm. And as I mentioned earlier, just the idea that statin medications increase risk for diabetes around 40% for men and around 71% yeah. in women we have to talk about this because it's hugely important. Well, I think the average woman over 65 takes six medications. That's the current American average. And by and large, you know, most of that is going to be statin drugs. 
Blood pressure antidepressants, pills, antidepressants, diabetes heartburn meds, meds <laughs> diabetes meds. They are they are like the cure and the pill for the ill. We've had Dean Ornish talk about reversing heart disease, a lifestyle program to reverse heart disease. We've seen functional medicine doctors reverse type 2 diabetes using lifestyle medicine. And you're talking about the work of Del Bredesen, a lifestyle program to reverse Alzheimer's disease. Is there really any chronic illness that we can't address through lifestyle? I don't believe so. And uh, I think the most compelling work um, is, uh, was done by Dr. Sarah Hallberg at Verda Health, looking at her uh, one-year intervention in type 2 diabetics. Uh, half the group continued to see their doctors uh, and get you know, standard medical care medication, et cetera, and the other half were placed on a ketogenic diet, a diet that lowered their sugar and carbs and uh, increased uh, their ketones. And the results were dramatic. I mean, she basically reversed diabetes in many of these individuals. One of the drugs that is commonly used in diabetes is called sulfonylureas. And in uh, the group uh, of patients, the interventional uh, group who were taking sulfonylureas for their diabetes, the, the percentage of those people who stopped those, those drugs was all, 100%. And when she, I interviewed her, when she told me that, I, my jaw dropped. I mean, it's absolutely breathtaking. So the, during the course of one year, the people on the interventional group going on the ketogenic diet actually overall reduced their medications. Uh, and the group that took standard of care actually had an increase in the number uh, and amount of medications that they were taking. So here she proved it um, in a, a fairly respectable cohort of individuals that you can do this with lifestyle and the results are going in the right direction, not the wrong direction. And well, yeah, that's interesting because we're taught that, we taught that we start with one drug for diabetes once that wears out, we add a second one. Once that wears out, we add a third one. And then you add, you insulin. Out, then you add insulin. And it's such a predictable path, and that path can be stopped and reversed. It needs to be stopped. That's the key uh, to lowering cardiovascular issues in women. Uh, I believe it relates to, obviously, diabetes, but also to Alzheimer's disease uh, and its relationship to elevated blood sugar and insulin resistance, and I believe cancer as well. I think the biggest risk for cancer is body fat. The next to exposure. It's, body it's, body fat. Fat. it's also elevated blood sugar. Uh, you know, time and time again, uh, the literature would confirm what you just said. Uh, you know, cancer loves sugar. There was a yes. study that was published uh, a couple of weeks ago. What a uh, great point. Demonstrate, I think it was non Hodgkin's lymphoma cells actually change uh, the gut bacteria in such a way as to increase the production uh, allow the blood sugar to elevate because they love it. And we're going to make changes in the neighborhood that suits us. So cancer cells increase blood sugar because they like sugar. And the Again, bacteria uh, in your gut will determine how you extract the sugar from certain foods. Oh, that's and right. Coming I mean, back uh, to your microbiome. That's correct. So, uh, you know, a very powerful event goes on there in terms of amplifying inflammation and making, uh, making as you mentioned, blood sugar uh, higher. I loved your metaphor of talking about the seasons, how in the past we use those seasons for different sugar contents to cue the body and to cue the genes. Our friend Jeff Bland talked at the International Congress about clock genes. So there's a, a moment to moment clock inside our genetic code. There's a monthly clock inside a woman's body and there's a seasonal clock that we have lost over time. It's, it's fascinating to me how all of these interactions portray with the environment and once those cues are gone, we start following down this slippery slope. We talked well, David, about this. What you're saying is, is really uh, critically important. Um, I spoke with Dr. Bland about that yesterday. Great. Uh, and uh, about the notion of chronobiology. I mean, again, it's an environmental uh, relationship that we have lost. This, uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, sunrise, sunset, the seasonality and its effects upon our bodies. And, um, you know, as we distance ourselves from that, we are distancing ourselves from uh, a powerful signaling mechanism uh, that, uh, you know, allows us to stay in sync with things around us. And we see, you know, devastating things are happening in, in response to that. Even just day to day, not getting enough uh, sleep at night, uh, having blue light exposure at nighttime from our tablets, our phones, our 
uh, TV monitors, et cetera, uh, really does change our physiology significantly by its effects upon melatonin, upon immunity, upon the quality of sleep that we get. And some real, you know, sleep is not a passive thing. You know, it's not like everything turns off during sleep. Some very important pathways are activated during restorative sleep that we need to pay attention to. Uh, the brain cleans itself up. We have activation of the glymphatic nervous, uh, glymphatic system to help the brain rid itself of debris, to consolidate memory. Uh, and now we see how very important uh, restorative sleep is uh, in terms of insulin sensitivity. And that relates problems with sleep to inflammation, to changes in the mitochondria, to getting back on that carousel, doesn't it? Well, you talk about sleep and this routine and this pattern, and, and there's probably one thing in lifestyle medicine that's most elusive to our clients. It is sleep. And as a neurologist, you know all of the things you can give medi medication-wise for sleep. What are some of the pearls that you have to share with our viewers about getting good sleep? You mentioned blue light. Are there other things that they can do, David? Of course. And, you know, I would say that um, – the notion in our society is that if you don't find that you're sleeping well, you know, you see the commercials of people up looking at their clock at two o'clock in the morning with the butterflies, sleep, whatever it is. Uh, and you know, you've got to understand that the sleep that you will get by taking a drug is not doing the job. Sure. You went to sleep and then you woke up at uh, whatever time, you know, you set your alarm, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, you, you feel, gosh, I got eight hours of sleep. I'm, I'm going to take that drug again tonight. The reality is that's not getting you to the type of sleep that you really need, of the depth of sleep, the restorative type of sleep that you need. And it is really very, very important. Sleep is as important for human health uh, as uh, the diet that we consume, which is obviously fundamentally important and not talked about. So uh, there are a lot of things to consider. I think we need to think about winding down in the evening that the TV shouldn't be on that the time to look at your iPhone and your computer screen is not at night. At night, If the sun goes down, those things go off. Great, because great as metaphor. you're bombarding your body with blue light and you know, light in general, you are compromising your body's ability uh, to make the sleep hormone melatonin, uh, and therefore the quality of your sleep is going to be reduced. You need to settle in in the evening. You should be eating your dinner several hours before you plan to go to sleep. You should certainly be watching the foods that you consume. You shouldn't be having uh, foods that are rich in uh, caffeine or uh, other things that may bother you as an individual, like tyramine, uh, cheese, uh, for example, other tyramine-rich foods. So I think it's really important to get um, you know, a handle on this. Make sure you're getting exercise each day. Uh, you know, This notion of going out and having a great dinner and drinking some wine, another thing that compromises sleep, though you are asleep, when you've had wine in the evening, that quality is, uh, is not as good as it would be had you not consumed alcohol. There's a lot of factors that you know, we talk about. I put this on my website for people to read. I've written about it in books. And it's really very, very important, especially, well, maybe not especially, but I mean, one thing we should consider is younger people. You know, these kids are up doing their homework mm -hmm. on their iPhones uh, and the computer to get their work done. And then we wake them up at six o'clock to catch the bus or uh, give them their breakfast and push them out the door while that breakfast is high carbohydrate. Right. What do you expect? <laughs> you know, the kids aren't sleeping well and they're bounded with uh, high uh, sugar foods in the morning. By 10 o'clock in the morning, they can't concentrate, can't focus, and they get a diagnosis. And the next thing you know, they're on a stimulant drug for ADHD. Let kids sleep. Maybe we should start our school hours a little bit later and let kids start their day with a breakfast that makes more sense, that provides some good fat and protein uh, for their brains and isn't a, a powerful carbohydrate sugar surge that makes them you know, have a high blood sugar, high insulin, and then insulin crashes their blood sugar. And by mid-morning, these poor kids are in trouble for no, through no fault of their own. And we've got to realize that we're tinkering with their brain energetics. No wonder they're having such troubles. It's interesting, two years ago in our community, Jackson Hole, we moved the school start time back. And we all realized it was just too early for our kids. And with the short, short days in the winter with the high elevation, it really made a big difference. That extra 45 minutes 
was a, a real benefit for the kids. I think you see better school performance. You see uh, less uh, car Stress, accidents. accidents. Uh, so I think, you know, there are many things that have, in studies that have been done uh, in places that have changed their uh, school start uh, hour to a little bit later, is really beneficial. Um, it makes sense. And, you know, you think, well, the kids will just stay up later. In actuality, they don't. Uh, they know they're up late uh, at, when it's, you know, 9 or 10 o'clock, and I'm sure later for others. But that tends to remain static. So if you push uh, later their time to get to school, they'll get a little bit more restorative sleep and they'll perform a lot better. And then well, feed them right. And that's the key. And we should do that to ourselves too. Who knew? David, you're, you're a teacher of teachers. You're a teacher of doctors. You're, you're knowledgeable. And the way you communicate all of these great ideas, I just love it. If our viewers want to connect with you, learn more about the work you're doing, how do they find you? Well, oddly enough, my website is drperlmutter.com, <laughs> drperlmutter.com. Um, my, the book Grain Brain that you mentioned uh, was just revised and just Great. published. So that's now out, uh, the Grain Brain five-year uh, revision. Um, I have Facebook, which is David Perlmutter, MD. Uh, but I think the best place to find me is, uh, I think, on the website. And that's where people can get our newsletter. Uh, which goes out every week and it's completely free. And, you know, my mission is just to get this information out and hope that people uh, are going to listen to it and maybe act on it. That would be the dream. Well, Grain Brain is one of my personal favorite books. I've given away at least a hundred to my clients. Well, I appreciate what, that. What's your next project? Where You've done so much to move the needle for health worldwide. What's your next project, David? Where are you putting your energy? Well, as you did mention in the intro, we have uh, in, in, later on this year, uh, we'll be publishing a book called The Microbiome in the Brain. We have leaders from around the world who have studied this relationship between what goes on in the gut uh, in terms of bacteria and other organisms uh, and uh, how that influences the brain. Uh, we have um, authors from MIT and Harvard and UCLA and Oxford. So really, really top people talking right. about this relatively new science. Mm -hmm. uh, in January of 2020, our new book comes out. Uh, I'm writing that with an Austin Perlmutter MD and David Perlmutter MD, that's me. That's our son. Great. Uh, and this book Great. is uh, called Brainwash. And it is about how we distance ourselves from the kind of negative influences that are so pervasive in modern society. Uh, the things that we see in social media, the negative effects of the modern Western diet upon the brain, our lack of sleep, our lack of exercise, and how we can reconnect to the good parts of our brain and distance ourselves from the fear parts and the egocentric parts of the brain. So I'm really uh, very, very excited about that. Uh, my, uh, Austin and I are having just an amazing time bonding and uh, congratulations right now. And uh, it's all about reconnecting, reconnecting to your gut, reconnecting to your neighbor, reconnecting to your uh, neighborhood, uh, your community, and reconnecting to the planet. So uh, that's, our pro uh, that's what's in the hopper right now, and it's a very exciting project. Well, I love your passion, David. Keep, keep pushing on, and I thank you so very much for joining us today. I'm delighted to be here, Mark. Thank you for having me.